everybody. So I'm going to introduce our uh, first lecturer. This is Jason Feuerman. He's, uh, he's one of our cornea fellows. He's been a great fellow to work with. I've learned a lot from him. He had did his medical school training at the University of Michigan, and he did his uh, residency in ophthalmology at Baylor. So, and today he's going to talk to us about, uh, about DMEX. So without further ado. Jason. All right. Thanks, Renee. Um, I'm all wired up here. So um, we uh, have started transitioning to doing some DMEX, um, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit, a little bit of background um, about DMEX, some pros and cons of the procedure, um, and show a video of uh, our first case with Dr. Mifflin and uh, some of the lessons we learned. Let's see. Okay. A um, little background, endothelial keratoplasty, um, we do it for a variety of reasons. Um, uh, the most common nowadays would be Fuchs dystrophy, um, uh, followed by uh, pseudophagic or aphagic bolus keratopathy. Um, after cataract surgery, this is decreasing in incidence um, because of the advances in technology um, in cataract surgery. Um, the rest of this group uh, are uh, patients that we operate on much more rarely, but anything really affecting the endothelium, posterior polymorphic dystrophy, um, CHED, uh, ICE syndrome, uh, and uh, endothelial failure from trauma um, or prior surgery, which is kind of gets grouped back to that one, um, or uh, failed uh, prior penetrating keratoplasty or endothelial keratoplasty. Uh, prior to uh, endothelial keratoplasty techniques being developed, um, which has really been only around less than 50 um, uh, the old solution was to do a PK, um, uh, full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. Um, there's uh, obviously some risks that come along with that. It's an open sky surgery. Um, there, uh, anytime the eye is wide open, there's risk of expulsive hemorrhage, which is, that's what this is a picture of happening in the back there, slowly. Um, uh, infection, it's a longer recovery. Um, we counsel our patients that it's going to take them a year to rehab their eye. Sometimes it's shorter. Um, uh, there's risk of dehiscence in the future. Uh, once we made that full thickness wound, it never uh, gets back to full strength. Um, uh, there's risk associated with sutures, infections, um, abscesses, uh, um, and there's uh, more refractive unpredictability and astigmatism with full thickness penetrating keratoplasty. This is a cool slide that shows sort of the evolution of endothelial keratoplasty over the past. 15 or 13 or so years. Um, uh, the first procedures performed in the United States were, were these DLEC procedures, deep lamellar endothelial keratoplasty. Had a variety of problems. Uh, it was also very technically difficult. Um, uh, what was done here is actually a, a, a deep stromal, interstromal dissection on the uh, host, um, uh, which was uh, ch uh, technically challenging. Um, and then that was also manually done on the on the donor, and, and it was stuck on. There's issues with interface irregularities, astigmatism, but it was a, a you know, the beginning of this evolution of um, uh, this evolving technique that we do now. Um, DSEC is depicted in the second OCT here, um, and that was basically with the um, start of doing decimeterexis. So instead of uh, doing a deep lamellar stromal dissection in the host tissue, we just strip off decimase membrane, uh, which, which allowed for a much more um, clean uh, uh, grain to adhere to on the, uh, on the recipient side. And then the I I for initially it was a DSEC, uh, D-S-E-K, and then the A, decimase stripping automated endothelial keratoplasty, uh, uh, came in when we started using micro to, to cut the uh, donor tissue. Uh, and then, so the focus of this talk is DMEC, where we do just a, uh, a replacement, uh, instead of including a little bit of posterior stroma, we replace just decimase membrane and endothelium, um, and you can barely even see uh, any graft on this photo here. Um, this is sort of the newest, but there's not a lot of data on it, and um, it's not really taken off yet for a variety of reasons, but this is DMEC, which where it's kind of a hybrid between DSEC and DMEC, um, and there's included stromal tissue in the periphery, but the center is pure decimase. Um, these are much more challenging to prepare 
uh, in the eye bank. This is also challenging to prepare in the eye bank, and I'll show some videos of that. But um, that's probably the primary reason this hasn't taken off. And it, it's the goal of DMAC is to uh, get rid of some of the challenges surgically with DMEC um, uh, in handling the tissues, so giving it some structure to work with. Um, but I uh, won't focus on that. So the advantages of endothelial keratoplasty in general are basically all the you know, disadvantages of uh, penetrating keratoplasty. You don't have a 360 degree penetrating wound. You main maintain the structural integrity of the cornea for the most part. Um, it avoids inducing high levels of astigmatism like you get with penetrating keratoplasty. There's faster visual recovery and a lower rate of graft rejection. Um, so DSEC versus DMEC. Uh, this study looked at patients with who received a DMEC in one eye, a DSEC in the fellow eye, um, and looked at them one year after surgery. The average best corrected visual acuity was better in the DMEC group, 20 over 24, uh, versus 2032 in the DSEC group. 85% of patients preferred the visual quality in the DMEC eye. 85% of patients reported faster visual recovery in the DMEC eye, and there was no difference in endothelial cell loss in one year. Um, uh, this study is from the Frank Price group, um, uh, looking at uh, rejection rates um, in the first two years after surgery. DMEC way down there, 0.7%. DSEC was 9% in this group looked at and penetrating keratoplasty of 17%. So lower rejection rate with DMEC as well. Um, but then this number in 2012, 22,000 DSECs performed in the United States and only 748 DMECs. And so why, why don't we have more DMECs in the United States, uh, you know, given those, those results? And um, the procedure is, it's more difficult, it's more time consuming. Um, the rebuttal to that is there's new, more standardized techniques that are emerging, so we're getting better at it. Um, there's risk in preparing the donor tissue um, when stripping it in the, in the R, which can mean lost dollars and lost tissue, um, uh, which is a limited resource. Um, uh, uh, there are emerging standardized techniques for that, and now eye banks are pre-stripping tissue, so um, the uh, surgeon performing D DMAC is, is increasing because that takes some of the the burden off of, off of the surgeon uh, to have it pre-stripped. Um, uh, the rebubble rates were really high initially when we started doing DMEC. Um, uh, with the uh, use of SF6 gas instead of air, it seems to be decreasing. Um, and uh, uh, some may ask if patients are already happy with DSEC, why change? Well, uh, one study demonstrated they do have better quality of vision. They have less higher order aberrations, but that can be argued um, either way. Um, uh, patients who are not good quality candidates for DMEC are patients with uh, glaucoma surgery, blebs tubes, anything really, any hardware in the anterior chamber because the DMEC tissue is, it's like wet tissue paper. It just, you know, it, it breaks easily. It, it's hard to manipulate uh, as you'll see. Um, so any ACIOL, um, if they have a poorly constricting or damaged pupil with inadequate iris support, you got to have some sort of uh, uh, support behind it uh, to get it. Uh, in the anterior chamber, if they're aphakic, um, uh, uh, DMEC has been lost into the back of the eye. And because we're using SF6, uh, if there's they can't have planned air travel within a uh, short post-operative period, um, uh, or mountain travel really for that matter. This is a photo that comes from, this is from the, the Portland Eye Bank Lions Vision GIF. Um, showing their pre-stripped uh, tissue, ha um, how it comes. So they pre-strip this area over here and then they leave just a little hinge attached and uh, notch the sclera. So you can see where the attached area is. So this, um, the introduction of the eye banks doing this pre-stripped tissue has um, started to increase the uh, rate of um, surgeons doing DMEC uh, in, in appropriate candidates. Um, our eye bank here is uh, working on uh, being able to pre-strip tissue for us uh, as well in the near future. That's a, a goal of Wade's um, in the near term. This is a video courtesy of Lions Vision Gift in Portland, Oregon that shows the process of stripping the tissue. So tissue's mounted on a tree fine and uh, the periphery is scored. Tripan blue is added for visualization and um, 
the edge of decimase is just carefully under, under BSS. Um, strip carefully. Put back down in position, refloated, um, and then put back in the, uh, uh, in the optosol. And ready to go. Made it look easy, but um, it's uh, easy to lose tissue damage or the tissue. analyze with a uh, uh, spectral microscopy to make sure the tissue is okay. So the surgical procedure has some similarities to BSEC, but there are some notable differences. There's a, a smaller incision because um, you're injecting the tissue in the scroll uh, through, a, through a smaller injector, so uh, through a smaller ejector, um, three to three and a half millimeter incision. Um, <coughs> uh, we make a decimeterexis just like we do in BSEC, uh, but the, the key difference there is that we make it larger than the graft as people uh, feel that uh, the, if, if the, there's overlap between the VMEC and the, and the, and the edge of the uh, strip decimase, that's more likely to detach. Um, <coughs> we want a soft eye when we're injecting because the material is very hard to uh, manipulate it, it moves around and if, if there's uh, any sort of pressure from within the eye, once, once you take the injector out, it can squirt right back out of the eye. Uh, a small pupil, you don't want to lose it posteriorly, you need some sort of platform to work on to help unfold it because it wants to scroll up and we make a uh, PI inferiorly because we're using SF6. Um, <coughs> so, uh, as you can see, once, we st once you strip off the tissue, it rolls into this nice tight little scroll which is uh, perfectly difficult to work with, um, and uh, and conveniently the endothelium is always on the outside. So um, uh, it'd be nice if it would protect itself, but um, uh, but it's it's just on, on the outside to be knocked around. Um, uh, this is the uh, the strip des uh, and stain decimase being um, sucked into the uh, uh, a glass injector, and, and it, it, um, it it felt that the gla uh, glass injectors. Um, are less traumatic than uh, some of the earlier plastic ones that have been uh, used, um, uh, less traumatic to the tissue, to the endothelium. Um, this one was, uh, this is a, a modified Jones tube that was developed by Mike Stryko in, in Portland, uh, where the, uh, the Jones tube was just enlarged um, uh, uh, to create a reservoir um, for, the, for the tissue to float around uh, inside. <coughs> uh, once it's inside the eye, uh, then the, the dance begins to try to unfold it uh, without touching it. And the, there are uh, now a variety of sort of standardized techniques that, that people are using. Um, uh, and it, it's th these are this is a photo from a, a paper by Yorick uh, describing some tapping techniques. Uh, but, but basically little fluid bursts through the paracentesis um, can help uh, unfold uh, one side, you keep a shallow chamber so that once you do unfold uh, one side of the graft that it stays unfolded. And uh, a finger on the side of the eye, as you can see here, can modify the, the chamber depth while you're, while you're working with it. Um, taps uh, on the surface of the cornea um, are used to direct fluid waves into, the, into those scrolls to try to get them to unfold. If there's a double scroll tapping right in the middle, we'll send uh, fluid waves out into those to unfold them. If you have one side unfolded and one side scrolled up, if you kind of hold a cannula on that unfolded side to keep it in place and tap across and unfold um, that, that, that scrolled side. Um, and then little burps of the wound, if there's one little edge that's, that's being troublesome and happens to be right next to a paracentesis of the wound, or burping a little fluid out of there can kind of get that last little bit to unfold. <coughs> Um, once it's inside the eye, uh, orientation is important, and it's sometimes difficult to tell the direction in which the graft is oriented. Um, there are a few tricks uh, uh, that have been described. Uh, one is uh, actually putting the S, putting this S stamp on the graft. Uh, the eye bank does that, and that helps. If you can see it inside the eye, that helps confirm that you're going in the right direction. That's probably the easiest method. Um, but people are using handheld slit lamps to check their orientation. 
Um, and then there's this Mutsuri sign where you take a, uh, some sort of cannula, uh, put it uh, on top of the graft and move it either to the left uh, or to the right so that it's under one of the scrolls. And if it turns blue, you know you're covered by the, by the scroll of the graft and that you're, you're in the right orientation. If it doesn't change colors when you move left or right, you know you're like this picture where the graft is upside down. Um, Post-operatively, these are some good photos of what a uh, detached graft would look like. Here it's edematous and the OCT, you can see the graft detached over here. This is a properly oriented graft though, you can tell because it's trying to curl that way. So the endothelium's on the right side and plus you can tell it's working over here. Um, but then after, after rebubble, it sticks back up. This is an example of a upside down graft. Um, and you can tell that again because of the curling of the graft. It always wants to curl with the endothelium on the outside. So the endothelium is on the stromal, in the corneal side here. Um, so this graft would need to be flipped over. Uh, so now I'm going to go through our first case, which was a, a humbling experience, but we learned a lot from it. Um, so started by making a approximately three and a half millimeter incision. And this is shown with Dr. Mifflin's permission. I'm not sure if he's in here. Um, so we make a shelf wound just like we, we normally do with DSEC, um, just a little bit smaller. Um, our, our normal three paracentesis that, that um, Dr. Mifflin likes to do with, with DSEC, do, do there's some variation to that. And here we're injecting viscoelastics and helon. Um, plotting out our uh, area that we're going to strip decimates. And now he's putting a little helon under the iris, and that's in, uh, in anticipation of making this PI here. I'm taking a bent needle and a Sinsky hook. Uh, stretch out there. Now the decimatorexis, nice wide area. And decimates is removed. Now we're just checking the size. That's that, st that Stryko modified Jones tube. We're just checking the size of the injector. It wasn't fitting quite as we wanted, so I enlarged the wound a little bit. IA, we've got a little iris coming out because we've enlarged the wound, um, but a uh, little myocall will bring it back in and bring the people down for us. And now here's our graft. It's been stained with tripan blue. And we're lightly trufining. We used a seven and a half millimeter trufine here. Um, and uh, the outer rim, the untrufined rim, is being removed now. We're left with just the graft in the center. And that little circle um, that you'll see is free floating as we squirt BSS on it. That is uh, a little, whoops. That's a little uh, stromal button um, that used to be in that opening there, and that's where the eye bank had removed a piece of stroma to put the S stamp on this graft, which unfortunately is not very visible, but um, that's what that came from. And because of where we had trufined, it, is, it had kind of come around. Um, it ultimately won't prove to be much of a problem, but that was uh, one thing we noted that we could have avoided in this case. Um, and uh, so now the tissue's being stripped. It's, it's pre-stripped, and this is actually from a different eye bank. This was actually pre-stripped peripherally and was still attached centrally, but it's not really, doesn't really matter there. It comes off and scrolls tightly immediately. And we've placed it in some BSS here. It's not very well stained, so we're going to add a little more tripan. after a little more BSS, it gets sucked into the injector. And so we thought the hard part was going to be unrolling it in the eye, but we found that just getting it in the eye was really um, the most challenging part of this particular case, as you'll see. So we're softening the eye, letting out a uh, uh, you know, nice soft eye. We don't want to inject it and then have it squirt right back out our wound. And here we are um, injecting. You'll see fluid going here. Uh, in a minute, and the graft isn't moving. 
So we ran out of BSS, so we deepen up the chamber, fill our tube back up with BSS, and try again. And the same thing happens. A little movement, but then we run out of BSS again. So, so this time we're going to go in and we figure we should turn the bevel of the injector up so that we're not bumping into iris, bumping into anything. So, um, uh, and then hopefully it'll come out. Um, and I'm going to stop the video right there. You can see the graft is right at the edge of the injector. Um, but we're going to go in bevel up. Um, but because the graft is right at the edge, this is another learning point. Um, unfortunately, as soon as it touches, it just comes right out. Um, and so now we're half in, half out. Um, and we need to try to get the graft back in a little BSS and take it back out of the eye. And now the endothelium is really mad at us. Fourth time's a charm. And we've got the bevel turned kind of sideways. Nice deep chamber, not still a soft eye though. And we inject and it, and it goes right in. And actually, to our delight, it starts to, it ends up perfectly centered and half unrolled. So, uh, so now we don't have that much more work to do. Suture the wound. And uh, by letting a little bit of fluid out of that paracentesis and gently tapping and directing fluid waves in that direction, uh, we get it to unroll pretty quickly actually. So here comes SX6 under the graft. Now, we, we didn't really pressurize the eye as much as we normally do with these sets, and we think maybe we should have um, uh, uh, really pressurized the eye and then, and then let out a little bit of the SX6. Um, uh, in the words of Dr. Mifflin, to seat the bead, um, because uh, I'll go through the post-op course here. Um, the, the the DMEC was in place on, on day one. Uh, there was a little bit of uh, separation anteriorly. Um, uh, it stayed attached superiorly but uh, in day four, but then it was the inferior 30% was starting to come off. Um, on day six, it was 50% detached, so that's when we uh, uh, pulled the trigger to rebubble. Actually stayed, so it, when we rebubbled it, we kept the eye nice and pressurized for a few minutes. Um, really, uh, really uh, pressurized it back up. And uh, uh, actually stayed attached since then, but was slow to clear. Obviously, there's a lot of trauma to that endothelium. Uh, although she was last seen on the 18th of May, um, which is now post-op month four, um, the DMEC was still attached, and she was now there was still a little bit of edema, but it continues to get better actually um, with every visit, um, uh, surprisingly. And, and her vision is now 2040 uncorrected, so um, she's happy. She actually called him this Dr. Mifflin this week to tell him that the DMAC eye is now seen better than the other eye. So she's ready to go on the other side. Um, and she had boots, I don't think I said that. But. Um, so um, lessons learned. Uh, we had a little iris prolapse because we went to IA after, the, um, after we already enlarged the wound. So that, that could be avoided by, getting, uh, by enlarging the wound before um, IAing. Um, we had that little uh, stromal uh, punch that was floating around on top of our DMEC while we were trying to strip it. And uh, that could have been avoided by trefining uh, uh, not on top of that particular area uh, if we move to the side a little bit. And, and you know, the S-stamp actually didn't really show up and we're not sure um, where we kind of lost, lost its clarity, but 
Um, it would have been nice to, to have that to confirm our orientation room at time. I didn't talk too much about that, but it, it, it was actually easy for us to see um, in the OR that it did seem to be oriented appropriately um, as it was sort of auto unfolding there when it, when it came out. But um, uh, the, the biggest problem we ran into was in the injection. And we, ne we now realize we need at least some chamber there um, and, and the bevel needs to be turned so it's not facing ag against the iris or any other tissue uh, so that there's some room for the, for the graft to come into the eye and nice tight seal around the, uh, um, around the, uh, uh, the wound uh, so that you don't lose fluid um, around the outside of that there. Um, and it's attached and we thought we would have been better off by um, uh, really pressurizing the eye for uh, for a few minutes um, during the initial surgery, uh, hopefully uh, pushing up the graft a little bit better. Um, and so, uh, in conclusion, EMEC is it's a true anatomic replacement for patients with endothelial dysfunction, has a potential for better visual quality and lower incidence of rejections versus DSEC, but there's a steep learning curve. Uh, uh, however, the technique is being standardized. So, I don't think any questions. Oh, yeah. Because I noticed that when you can at the time do the disease um, naturally, mm -hmm. and then uh, the graft, graft doesn't really lose out all the way to the tissue. Mm -hmm. So um, that sort of um, put it at an absolute um, cost to the program to sort of do the calculation the way you just showed. So what she actually does is prior to activating up the graft, she will um, kind of put these lead strips that go through that part of the cerebral area and then cut into it there. Above 50, I think, is the number that I've read, um, uh, and so it's easier to unroll. That, that's that's basically what I've read about the. Uh, is that what you were? Yeah. Yeah. So aside from all the technical issues, what's the most important thing? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess the problem is working on any other time, but, but the, the problem in this case is you really need that stimulation, and I don't know what other options there are um, out there. Uh, 
in there. Um, there may be some but just like that, um, enough to allow us to Dr. Roscoe has some comments. I have a lot. Thanks. So this is actually directed to the residents. Um, I was unable to be there on Friday, and I, I was overwhelmed and humbled and um, just so appreciative for the Faculty of the Year Award. And I didn't know about it. And then it was kind of funny because Elaine and Lynn and Alicia were all emailing me because I was stuck in Texas um, at a business meeting. And I thought something was up, so that's why I emailed Randy, and I just said, Randy, I don't know what's going on, but I please explain <laughs> that I can't be there. And I actually had it on my calendar for two months, as soon as Alicia had sent up the, uh, told the date, it was on my calendar. But um, I just wanted to say that I think to be able to work with you is such a privilege for us as attendings, and to be able to teach you is really, it's, it's really a privilege and an honor. And the fact that you gave me this award sends a tremendous message back to me that what I do 